Thank you. I knew I could. I knew I could count on that. <laughs> Welcome everyone to the uh, Wednesday, November sixteenth, twenty twenty-two meeting of the Dr. Cog Board of Directors. And good to see so many of you here in person. I know that some of our folks are off at National League of Cities, uh, so we wish them uh, luck. And I don't know if any alternates are here. Uh, Melinda has told me that there are no new members to report tonight. Uh, one thing I do want to uh, ask before we get started is because we record the meetings, could you be very uh, intentional about speaking directly into the microphones because the recording uh, skips out like you're in a bad cell phone area if this little red ring is not lit up. And so that's a special request from Melinda and to anybody who might listen to a recording of the meeting afterward. Uh, the other thing is that there's, you notice there's a little instruction uh, uh, template below each of your microphones. The only button that you need to uh, be concerned with is the second one over, the one that says mute. When you touch it, like I just did. <laughs> so but when you want to speak, touch it so that the little red light goes off, and then the microphone will pick you up. And then when you're finished talking, please touch it again to turn it off. So with that, let me call the meeting to order. Uh, could we please stand as you are all able, and we'll do the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. Um, Melinda, can we have the roll call, please? Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, here we go. Uh, Steve Odoricio of Adams County. Jeff Baker of Arapahoe County. Here. Claire Levy of Boulder County. Here. William Lindstedt, uh, City and County of Broomfield. Here. Randy Wheelock, Clear Creek County. George Marlin of Clear Creek County. Nicholas Williams, City and County of Denver. Here. George Teal, Douglas County. Abe Layden, Douglas County. Webb Sill, Gilpin County. Tracy Craftharp, Jefferson County. Andy Kerr, Jefferson County. Lisa Smith, City of Arvada. Here. Allison Coombs, City of Aurora. Royce Pindell, Town of Bennett. David Spellman, City of Blackhawk. Nicole Spears, City of Boulder. Margo Ramson, Town of Bomar. Here. Dan Plowski, City of Brighton. Here. <clears throat> Deborah Mulvey, City of Castle Pines. Here. Jason Gray, Town of Castle Rock. Tim Dietz, Town of Castle Rock. Tammy Maurer, City of Centennial. Mike Sutherland, City of Centennial. Cara Tanucci, City of Central. Jeremy Fay, City of Central. Randy Wheel, City of Cherry Hills Village. Here. Craig Hurst, City of Commerce City. Here. Steve Conklin, City of Edgewater. Here. Othaniel Sierra, City of Inglewood. Here. Ari Harrison, Town of Erie. Sarah Laughlin, Town of Erie. Linda Montoya, City of Federal Heights. Sonia Jensen, City of Federal Heights. Don Cognac, Town of Firestone. David Whelan, Town of Firestone. Josie Cockrell, Town of Foxfield. Lisa Jones, Town of Foxfield. Lynette Kelsey, Town of Georgetown. Rachel Binkley, City of Glendale. Present. Paul Hazeman, City of Golden. Sure. George Lance, City of Greenwood Village. Dave Kerber, City of Greenwood Village. Chuck Harmon, City of Idaho Springs. Stephanie Walton, City of Lafayette. Brian Wong, City of Lafayette. Jeslyn Shrezai, City of Lakewood. Here. Stephen Barr, City of Littleton. Here. Jamie Jeffrey, Town of Lock Bowie. David Ott, Town of Lock Bowie. Wynn Shaw, City of Lone Tree. Here. Joan Peck, City of Longmont. Ashley Stolzman, City of Louisville. Holly Rogan, Town of Lyons. Greg Edding, Town of Lyons. Colleen Whitlow, Town of Mead. David Adams, Town of Mead. Paul Sutton, Town of Morrison. Here. Meredith Lighty, City of North Glen. Richard Kondo, City of North Glen. Here. John Dyack, Town of Parker. Here. Sally Daigle, City of Sheridan. Here. Neil Shaw, Town of Superior. Tim Howard, Town of Superior. Jessica Sandgren, City of Thornton. Julia Marvin, City of Thornton. 
Sarah Nermella, City of Westminster. Uh, Bud Starker, City of Wheat Ridge. Present. Rebecca White, CDOT. Sally Chafee of CDOT. Brian Welch of RTD. Here. All right, and with that, Mr. Chair, we do have a quorum. Thank you very much, Melinda. Uh, it's good to see so many of you here. We were wondering uh, with the uh, NLC going on and other commitments, how many folks would make it. So thank you for coming down. Uh, number four, uh, we need a motion to approve the consent agenda. Would there be someone willing to do that? That was uh, Director Daigle. Second. Second came from here, uh, Mayor Starker. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Uh, aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Unanimous. Thank you. And thank you, uh, Director Coombs, for bringing, again, the most beautiful baby I have ever seen. <laughs> My God. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, incredible, thank you. <laughs> Next item, please, uh, is a report of the chair. And I have essentially one item I wanted to uh, to mention, other than, again, thanking everybody for being here, is uh, uh, the, uh, first of all, if I can say, there will not be a board of directors meeting on the third Wednesday of December, December 21st, so we have, we're canceling that meeting. Uh, but there will be a board work session, and uh, I don't want to steal any thunder from uh, Executive Director Rex if you intended to talk about this. But the sole topic of the sole topic of that will be uh, discussion, a continuing discussion, or a resumption of the discussion that we had at the board retreat earlier in the year about the nexus uh, that we are looking at building between uh, the primary mission that we have and housing uh, in the metropolitan area. Uh, we had a very wonderful retreat on it. We had a lot of questions that came out of it. You might recall that the executive committee and then this board had a brief discussion a few meetings back where we asked staff to put together a structure. I don't know if this is cutting out, in or out or not. Is it okay? Okay. Uh, we asked staff to put together the structure of a, of a regional discussion on the tie-in between all of the infrastructure that we funnel through this group to all of our members and the provision of at housing, and not just any housing, but affordable housing, a denser housing, housing that is near our transportation investments. And the federal reauthorization, uh, the recent one, gives us the ability to look at this nexus and to make sure that our plans are coordinated. So please, uh, this will be a virtual meeting. Uh, so it's uh, easy to attend, and I ask you all to uh, clear your schedules for December 7th, and please attend that meeting. That is all that I had. Let me ask now for a report from the Performance and Engagement Committee, uh, Director Shaw. Thank you so much. Uh, there were actually two meetings since I've last reported. Uh, we did uh, elect a member of the nominating committee. Uh, or, yes, from p and &E, John Dyack. Um, this evening, we uh, completed the executive director's review. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next report from the Finance and Budget Committee, Director Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We had... Um, we convened first at 5.30 for the annual meeting of the Regional Response Incorporated, and um, everything went well with that. We received the audit of that Regional Response. For those of you that may not know, Regional Response is a 501c that, the, um, that Dr. Cog has had in working since the 1990s. So that went off really well. We then uh, reconvened as the Finance and Budget Committee, and we had several different um, or several different uh, action items that we approved tonight. The first one was a resolution authorizing Executive Director Rex to allocate additional federal and state funds to a AAA contractors totaling two thousand. I'm sorry, two million seven hundred thousand dollars. That's for the state fiscal year ending June 30th, 2023. We also had a resolution 
authorizing the executive director to accept state funds of $529.670 from Senate Bill 21290 and allocate them to projects as approved by the state unit on aging. We also received a presentation from CLA, oh, yeah, Clifton Larson, on the audit for 2021-2022 and updates to the Dr. Cog's investment policy. Those were both informational items and we had our informational briefings. We had two informational items, uh, additional contractors for the AAA in-home choice services program and Dr. Cogs applying for a uh, SMART grant, a Strengthening Mobility and Revolutionizing Transportation Grant. And that concludes my report. Thank you, Director Baker. Uh, next up is report of the Executive Director, uh, Mr. Rex. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. And good evening, everyone. Small and cozy group today. Um, I came in this morning and, and Melinda was at her desk and as I was coming in, she turned around and I saw her face and was like, I don't know if we're going to have quorum. So we had a moment and uh, we started getting emails and texts out, but you guys never disappoint. So thank you all so very much. We, uh, we're, we have more than enough for a quorum tonight. I know there's a lot going on as we head into the holiday season. Um, not only is it, are we entering the holiday season, but this is also a uh, federal discretionary grant application season, it seems. And uh, as, as Director Baker mentioned, we are applying for, we're actually applying for two different uh, discretionary grants. The first one is a SMART grant. Um, and so I just want to give you a little bit of background on this so you want to, there's no surprises if, I should say, when we get the grant. Um, so several years ago, we piloted this human services trip exchange prototype and we work with our transportation providers, primarily in the, in the paratransit world. Um, servicing um, our older adults, veterans, persons with disabilities, and the like. And, um, and the whole concept behind that is was to improve the regional coordination uh, so for more effortless uh, mobility for, for these individuals. Um, and it kind of stalled a little bit during COVID, but we did get enough of the pilot done that there were some really good recommendations that we wanted to include um, in, this, in this prototype. It's, it's a technology you know, fix for for this this whole concept. It's a hub concept where the transportation providers will provide their information and their availability to take on trips, and then our older adults and others would then, uh, on the other side, transmit the request into the hub, and then they would be matched. Right. So, th so this whole concept we're we're excited about. So we're applying for the smart grant for planning monies to help incorporate. Um, these recommendations into the process, and then hopefully, if we're successful, then the implementation of that in phase two of the SMART grant application. So, so stay tuned on that. The other um, uh, uh, USDOT discretionary grant that we're applying for is through a new Thriving Communities Technical Assistance Program, and the purpose of this program is to provide two years of technical support, um, planning and capacity building to help develop a pipeline of transportation and community revitalization activities. So we're working to identify any opportunities that we could we could find to align with our regional issues, such as transportation access, air pollution, housing, revitalization, and the like. So we we have or will have we sent out? Okay, we will be sending out um, a, a solicitation to city county managers as well as key point staff to see if there's opportunities for us to partner with with uh, with communities. So just kind of an FYI in case. Um, you know, your city manager asked what the heck Dr. Cog is doing down there. So geez, at least you're somewhat aware. Um, so those, those letters, it's a pretty quick turnaround. It's with all these discretionary grants, it seems. So we, uh, the, uh, the letters of interest are due December 6th. All right, enough on that. So Gotober Challenge, which is our annual challenge to, for employers to, um, to hopefully shift um, uh, to alternative modes during the month of October. We had 64 um, uh, businesses throughout the region that participated. And I uh, just wanted to announce the winners of the five categories. So extra large 2,000 plus employees, University of Colorado and Shoes Medical Comp uh, Campus in Aurora won, won that. Um, the large category, hi Rebecca, um, uh, Denver Water won that. The medium size, 100 to 500 employees, 
at Celerant LLC in Denver. Small company, 51 to 100. Uh, Felsberg, Holt, and Ulevig, H, uh, FSU, FHU as I know them. And then the extra small company, one to 50 employees, Feedback Sports out in Golden. So it's pretty cool. And by the numbers, collectively, employers, employees track nearly 16,000 trips on alternate modes, saving more than 49 tons of carbon dioxide emissions. So it, it's we've we've really ramped this up through the years. Um, we've started out Watch Steve with like 25 companies, and it's, it's been expanded to 64, which is great. There was a number of lo of our member local governments that also participated, including Englewood, Aurora, uh, Westminster, Superior, Louisville, Broomfield, Boulder County, City of Lakewood, Golden, Littleton, and uh, and Denver. So uh, let me see. There was something else I wanted to point out on that. Oh, so, yeah. So they all participated, and I just wanted to give a, a shout-out to, to Englewood, who just beat out Boulder County in the large employer category. So thank you so very much. <laughs> Pretty darn cool. All right, I just want to mention Cog Cares <laughs> right across the room from each other, just to stare down. So um, Cog Cares, I, want to, I mentioned this last month, and that's our internal volunteer program, which our staff has an opportunity to give back to the community, and we're really, really, really proud of it. We have three events, uh, actually four events um, in the month over the holiday season that I just wanted to share with you, just, to, just so you know the type of staff that you have here at Dr. Cog. Um, so we will be making and delivering holiday cards two days, uh, two lunch times in December for veterans in this area. This, we've done that for a number of years now. We uh, once again we're sponsoring the Sparley Center to deliver gifts to residents in this assisted living facility, um, and they're so so appreciative. We get letters every year from them uh, with with uh, with just you know so much thanks. They're so grateful. We're actually doing a food drive here as well in December, and anybody that was upstairs might have seen the boxes. And last but not least, Englewood, um, Cafe 180. Um, we're going to be volunteering with them. Um, if those that don't are not familiar with the Englewood Cafe, um, they serve anyone. They provide free free food for uh, uh, with dignity, as they state, um, and you know it's more of a pay-as-you-go type of thing. So we're really in, we're really excited to uh, be able to get back to our broader regional community. Um, Two other things. So first, on as, as uh, Director Baker mentioned, um, we had our audit presentation by our, our auditors uh, at the Finance and Budget Committee. Um, it was a clean audit. We're, we're so, I'm so proud of the work that Jenny Dock, I don't know if she's present, our finance director and, um, and her staff have done over the past year. This has been a very difficult time, as you know, with COVID and all the various funding sources that we've had coming in just to keep track of all that. Um, big shout out to Sharon Day on Jenny's team that works almost exclusively with the AAA. Um, thank you all so very much, it's, it's great work. And we were understaffed this year. We lost our staff accountant. So Jenny, you know, she put in some just crazy hours. So I, I really, I mean, if you get an opportunity to say thank you, please do so. Uh, and last but not least, I wanted to acknowledge the recent elections. We had, I want to congratulate um, some that are moving on. Um, I know uh, Director uh, William Lindstedt from Broomfield is moving to the State House, and we're very excited for you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, and a uh, uh, director alternate, uh, Juni Joseph from the um, City of Boulder, she's moving to the State House too. So, with, so congratulate her for us. As you can probably guess, Rich Morrow, he's making lists, man. He can't wait. He can't wait to get on your schedule, so just so you know. Um, and, of course, Ashley, Ashley Solzman, mayor of Louisville, is moving to uh, Boulder County as commissioner. So congratulations. We, we also have three re-elections that I'm aware of, and I apologize if I'm missing anyone. Please shout it out if I miss them. Uh, first of all, Commissioner Steve Odoricio, Adams County, re-elected. Um, Trustee Neil Shaw, who's not present tonight, he had a conflict. He's been uh, reelected in in Superior. That is so. There's a big turnover in Superior. If you don't know, five new members uh, of their Superior Board of Trustees. Of, I think there's seven, right? Yeah. So that's a big turnover. And uh, Mayor Jason Gray from Castle Rock was also reelected. He's not present tonight either. I don't think so. Any others I missed? Okay. 
Well, thank you also very much. I've been doing this work a long, long time, as you know. I have such appreciation for the work that locally elected officials do. No one will ever understand the phone calls that you all get in the middle of the night. And uh, so I, I'm so appreciative. So thank you all. And I'll just leave it there, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. And, and congratulations to all of the folks that Doug mentioned moving on or moving up. Um, we, I actually offered to convene a December meeting so that uh, Director Lindstedt could have one more opportunity to be here, but he declined. <laughs> <laughs> uh, next item is public comment. Uh, we allocate up to 45 minutes for public comment. Uh, each speaker would have three minutes. Uh, if we uh, run out of, if we have more than 45 minutes, we'll do it the rest at the end of the meeting. Uh, we just request that there be no public comment on issues for which a prior public hearing already has been held before the board. Uh, do we have anyone here present who wishes to offer public comment? The board. I don't see any. Let me ask Melinda if anyone is on our Zoom call who might want to offer public comment. If you are on a Zoom call and you wish to make comment, please raise your virtual hand. Play the Jeopardy music in your head for a second. <laughs> Nobody? Yeah, I just want to make sure because we have had uh, comment that I think most every meeting we've had up until now. Okay, uh, seeing none, we will move on. Uh, next item is we need a motion to approve our consent agenda, which consists of the minutes of last month and the fiscal year 22-25 TIP policy amendments. And that's it. Uh, Director Shaw moves. Second. That was uh, Director Baker seconding. Any comment? Seeing none, um, all in favor of approving the consent agenda say aye. Aye. Any opposed say no. Thank you. Any abstentions? No. It is approved. Thank you. Action item. First up, select a representative to the nominating committee. Uh, the board uh, as a whole elects a member to serve on the nominating committee. And I think what we're looking for now is nominations from the floor. Can You can self-nominate. You can self-nominate. Or you can nominate someone else, maybe someone who isn't even here. <laughs> <laughs> who's, that, who's that NLC? <laughs> do, we, do we have any uh, nominations? Uh, Director Baker. I'd like to uh, nominate Deborah Mulvey from the city of Castle Pines to serve on. Thank you. Uh, Director Mulvey, are you willing to accept that nomination? They do. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other nominations? Going once, going twice. I see no one stepping forward or raising their hand. All right, nominations are then closed. And can we uh, have a motion to, do we need a motion to do this? We do, we do need a motion. Okay. Just, just so everybody understand, just real quick. I, yes. I, oh, actually John had a. Okay, okay. Uh, Director Dyack. I, I thought we needed two um, yeah. as opposed to one. Just, yes, I we know. do. I, I was just going to point that out too. So, so we basically have two vacancies right now. One is, um, is selected at large from the board, and then the other is an appointment of the chair. So, um, so really, we need need the action is on the one that's chosen from the chair from from the, from the board. Right. The other one, Kevin can do that at any time. <laughs> if, he, if he so desires. Who, who's on my naughty list? <laughs> <laughs> okay. I see no other nominations for the at-large from the board. Uh, I, would, uh, I would solicit a motion to approve the appointment of Director Mulvey to the nominating committee. That was uh, who moved it. Uh, Director Hazeman, Director Conklin seconded. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you very much, uh, Director Mulvey, for doing that. I will, uh, I'll put all your names in a barrel and I'll, I'll pick someone. But let me ask if anyone is interested, please let me know tonight. And uh, what, what is that? What's the commitment? Do we have the schedule yet for the meetings? No, we don't, but we anticipate um, we're going to schedule two, one hopefully in late December or two in early January, one or the other. Okay. So. That'll be, time. So that'll be the time frame. If you're able and willing to consider serving on the nominating committee, please let me know. Thank you. All right. Uh, discussion of fiscal year 22-27 uh, TIP 
recommend uh, call three recommendations for the regional share, and this is going to be uh, Mr. Uh, Cottrell. Todd. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I was trying to think of, we all seem like a light group tonight, so I thought I'd come up with something witty, but I, I don't know. <laughs> Dr. Cog, we still have more funding. I, I, I don't know. I didn't really have anything. <laughs> no, I didn't say it was going to be good, but <laughs> all right. Well, thank you for joining us tonight. And I will say um, of the four calls for projects that we have in front of us, we are almost hopefully with your action tonight, three quarters of the way through that. Um, so just in kind of remind us of where we are. Um, last summer, we had identified $466.4 million of funding that was going to be available over the 22 to 27 timeframe. Um, and we did split that into four individual calls for projects. The first two calls for projects, we're going to solely focus in on the current 22 to 25 tip and it was going to be for air quality and multimodal projects only. As we moved into the 24 to 27 tip, a development of a brand new transportation improvement program, we would open that up to all project types, and then we would also have two additional calls to program those four years. Just uh, as a summary, in those first two calls, we did program $206 million. Um, that was completed this last September. So hopefully those project sponsors are already in the process of working with CDOT or RTD um, to begin their IGA process. So now we are in the conclusion of call three and perhaps a little bit more detail about that. Um, so we did have an eight week call for project, uh, call for projects and that was open um, from August 22nd to October 11th. Um, as I just stated, there was two tracks. So applicants had the um, option to submit either in an air quality multimodal track or a track that was solely dedicated for the surface transportation block grant funding. As outlined within our TIP policy, each forum was allowed to submit up to three regional applications, and then also CDOT and RTD were allowed to submit up to two applications each. So as you can see in the table below, it does outline the available funding for this call by year and also by funding type. With that, we had received 19 applications that we posted on our website once that application um, time closed. Uh, we also outlined by subregion applicant in which track they applied into. After that, uh, a dozen Dr. Cog staff did score each question and each project. Um, we developed a, weighting, a weighted average score for each one of those applications and used a scoring system from zero to five, five being the highest. Also, with this process, as we began with calls one and two, we also did open a public comment period, which was from October 12th to the 26th, and received over 1,200 individual comments through this process. Um, those commenting could submit on a web map or by email or by phone. They could also, in addition to adding a comment, they could also indicate to an individual project whether they gave support, had concern, or were opposed to that individual project. Those public comments, along with the Dr. Cog score, was provided to what we call a project review panel that we use for the regional share. Um, this panel met twice the week of October 31st, and after receiving those scores and comments, actively deliberate, deliberated um, to provide a recommendation for each track in overall wait list. Um, the panel is made up from one technical representative from each of the eight sub-regional forums, in addition to a CDOT and RTD technical representative, and three subject matter experts. So with that, here is their recommendation that they came up with. So this is just outlining the air quality and multimodal track. Um, there was a recommendation for four, to fund four projects. Those are in the project that's called project rec or panel recommendation highlighted in gray. Um, all th the top three projects were funded at their full request. Um, with the last project uh, submitted by Denver, so for South Platte River Trail improvements, was submitted at a slightly lower amount, uh, but in talks with Denver staff, they would be able to fund that full scope. Um, just because of the room on the next slide, I was unable to, um, I had to slide in the regional share waitlist, but I did want to mention concerning the waitlist of projects, which is basically all of the projects that were not part of the panel's recommendation. Um, their initial recommendation at this time is to fund 
those projects in score order. However, they would like to, at the conclusion of call four, go back and revisit the order of li that list because it will change. Um, some of these regional projects will hopefully be submitted um, through their application in call four and therefore would come off of this list. So they would like the opportunity to revisit that list. At that time, the new regional wait list um, will become part of the draft tip that will come back um, through the public comment process and then finally for adoption. Finally, within the STBG uh, track, um, again, a recommendation of, to fund four projects. Um, the first being the, uh, the federal BRT funded slightly under their full ask. Um, in, a, in talks with CDOT, they would be able to fund the full scope within that $15 million um, amount. Um, the next project is the 119 NIWAT BRT from Boulder County. Um, the panel's request or recommendation would be to fund only $6 million of that $16 million request. However, that would go to funding the Q bypass lanes, the BRT platform, and the intersection improvements only as part of that project. Um, finally, for Peaks to Plains, um, they would like to essentially fund this with the leftover funds out of both projects or out of both tracks. So fund approximately half with it with the remaining STVG after funding the full request for the Peoria Street Bridge project submitted by Aurora and fund the remaining portion um, of a smaller amount towards the Peaks to Plains using $5 million of the air quality and multimodal fund. Um, in talking with Jefferson County, most likely they would come back and enact the full amount of this uh, request through call four. So that in a nutshell is the, um, the panel's recommendation before you. Um, in the last two days, both the Technical uh, Transportation Advisory Committee and the Regional Transportation Committee um, did recommend approval. Um, before we get to the proposed motion, just sort of the next steps in this process. Um, on November 28th, when we return from the holiday, we will be opening call four, which will um, go until January 27th. After that call close, closes, we will turn the scoring sheets and all the project information over to each ind individual sub-regional forum. They will go through their scoring and recommendation process through the months of February to April. And at that time, Dr. Cox staff will take all this information from call three and four, complete a draft um, tip document covering 24 to 27. Of course, then we'll have the public hearing process concluding in July, and then back to you guys at the board level um, looking for adoption of that document um, in your August timeframe. So with that, happy to take any comments or questions. Um, unless the proposed motion before you is to move to allocate regional share funds to eight projects to be included in the new 24 to 27 transportation improvement program. Thank you, Todd. Uh, just to be uh, uh, proper about it, could I solicit a motion first and a second and then engage in discussion? Uh, Director Odoricio. Move to approve as presented. Thank you. Is there a second? Uh, Director Williams. Thank you. Uh, let's, let's have some discussion on it. Uh, Todd, unless I missed this, I'm sorry if you said it, uh, the, uh, the, the review panel actually went out in the field and looked at these projects. That is correct. Um, that was took, pretty cool. We took four or two four-hour blocks um, in two vans and actually drove to most of the locations just to be able to give our staff, the ones who were scoring, um, the ability to really see. I think we can get a lot more context versus looking at Google Maps. So I think that was the over, overwhelming response that we received. Thank you. I like that. Uh, comments, questions on any of these recommendations? Yes. Am Dr. I reading this right? Yeah. Um, I noticed that one of them is two years of funding for free trans transit service. And I'm just curious why other places didn't submit if that's a variable that would be accepted free transit. So you're talking about specifics on the, that individual project or more of what the panel I think it's more. I think it's more broadly of if we're approving free two years of transit for a certain area, why is it that other, other cities and municipalities are not applying for free transit? I mean, that's a good question. I would have to ask the actual project sponsors to if that is something that they would like to maybe even support within call four to actually make those applications to us 
um, if that is something that they wish to do. Yeah, I'm not going to put my uh, partner, Director Williams, on the spot on that. <laughs> Would any uh, uh, project sponsor like to weigh in on that? Any of your staff here that you might want to call on? Director Mulvey. I just muted myself. I can share that in some of the smaller municipalities, there are a multitude of priorities. And then we're in a sub-region that has many priorities and we don't have RTD. So a lot of those factors come into play. So without answering it specifically, for a particular town, I can tell you that that often are the factors. Uh, Director Levy? Well, and yeah, and Director Levy, Boulder County, I, I can just speak to, you know, our sub-regional forum voted to, to move this forward because this is new service on a corridor that we're really focusing on trying to rebuild and make uh, appropriate for express transit service. So this was something that the Boulder County sub-regional forum brought forward, but I think it's, you know, I heard in your question, not a question about why are we doing this in Boulder County, but why aren't other areas also looking for a similar opportunity? Thank you. Director Stolzman? I think it's a great um, a, a great idea to buy down the fare box for the whole region, right? We did the fare free month and it was very successful, at least in our area and the places that I visited on transit. So I think it'd be a great regional application for RTD to submit on all our behalf to just buy down the fare box. Um, so I think we could encourage RTD um, to submit that project so that we can score it and review it. I think that's a great idea. Thank you. Anything else? Any other comments? Seeing none, um, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor of approving the uh, 2227 Transportation Improvement Program call three recommendations. Please say aye. 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 Any opposed, please say no. Any abstentions? Thank you. It is approved. Excellent. Uh, now we go into our inf oh, okay. Uh, now we go into our informational briefings and uh, quarter planning program, community-based transportation plans. Uh, Jacob Rieger is going to do this for us in place of Nora Kern. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good evening, everyone. Um, these are two new pilot transportation planning programs that we're starting at Dr. Cog, so we wanted to kind of brief you on uh, where we think these are going to go as we get them started. So I'm going to talk about two programs tonight. The first is a corridor planning program. So I'm not going to read this slide to you, but just in a nutshell, the emphasis or the, the genesis for this program is all of the great work that we all did together over two years to develop and then adopt our 2050 Regional Transportation Plan and then the nine months that we just spent revising it uh, for the state greenhouse gas planning standard. I know you all missed my presentations on that. Um, but the point is in the adopted plan that, you know, we made, some, we made some serious and meaningful commitments around the investments and the projects that we're going to implement in this region over time, both in the near term and the short term. So in this program, we're kind of asking ourselves, you know, we all play a role, everyone in this room, your staff, local government, CDOT, RTD, Dr. Cog, we all work together on various corridor studies, what are known as PEL studies, visioning studies, NEPA studies, uh, to implement projects and investments in the region. The idea behind this program is what can Dr. Cog staff do intentionally to kind of help that process, particularly with corridors that need kind of that first step um, in that study process, that for whatever reason they haven't had the energy or the resources to kind of get some of these corridors going, can we step in and kind of help out um, in terms of getting some of those, um, those processes underway. Um, so really, we're trying to identify those major investments in the plan in those corridors, projects in those corridors, and help start moving them forward. Another piece of this, the last bullet on this slide, is to track planning efforts on regional corridors. I'll show you in a couple slides a static map, but we're building an interactive web map where you know, all of you, all of us as stakeholders, but even the public at large could just click on a corridor and kind of understand 
you know, what are the corridor studies? What are the planning efforts on a particular corridor? What's happening on federal? What's happening on 119? And we intend that as a resource both for us kind of technically in our agencies, all of you, but also the public, um, again, to just bring our planning process transparently um, to the region. So um, again, this is a pilot program. We have not done this before, so we're kind of sketching out what we think this could look like. We have identified some overarching priorities and then kind of some specific priorities. Um, these relate to things like lo local jurisdiction buy-in. So for example, the, the structure of this program is that Dr. Cog, we would bring our staff and our planning funds forward to kind of help, again, take the lead on sort of a first step corridor visioning, corridor planning type study. But we wanna partner with a local jurisdiction or jurisdictions I should say, and we want local jurisdictions to have that buy-in in terms of your staff and your time to partner with us. Obviously, we want this to be transferable and have regional impact over time. Um, you know, obviously, we're looking at projects and investments included in the 2050 plan, and we're thinking about readiness a little bit. You know, we have projects staged throughout the plan. We obviously want to focus on projects and investments that are staged sooner in the plan, but we also want to start the process for projects that are a little bit farther out um, because it takes time to get some of this going. Um, and then in terms of more specific priorities, things like advancing equity um, in the region, building out the regional transit network um, that we've committed to together in the plan, addressing safety concerns as outlined in our regional vision zero action plan and in our 2050 regional transportation plan, and expanding multimodal transportation. Most of the investments or just about all the investments in our regional transportation plan and many of those corridors are multimodal in nature. That's the focus that we're taking, both multimodal transportation and connecting land use and transportation together in this corridor planning. So this is just the process. We um, There's about 59 eligible corridors in the plan when you kind of think of the array of investments and projects and corridors in the 2050 plan. Um, so we did a call for letters of interest. We did that in October. Uh, we received four uh, kind of letters of interest for four corridor projects by the end of October. Um, our selection panel actually met this week to kind of start working through those. Um, I think we're getting close to a decision. And then I also want to show, um, and well, let me come back to this for a second just to make the point um, that as we get into this, so you know, once we get through the selection, we'll procure a consultant, we'll kind of get things set up. Uh, we are thinking to do two corridors um, as we get into next year. Again, this is a pilot, so we want to do two different corridors together um, to kind of, you know, learn from both of those, do those in tandem, um, do that as a pilot, kind of learn some lessons, bring that back to you before we institutionalize this as part of the 24 to 27 Transportation Improvement Program. So last thing on corridors, as I said, we're building this corridor map. This is a prototype. Um, but again, just to really make this information available from a stakeholder and a public perspective, uh, what's going on with the corridors, um, how are they depicted in our regional transportation plan, what are different agencies doing, because you all, um, as local governments, can lead corridor studies, CDOT does a lot, um, RTD, et cetera. So we want to kind of make that information available to us and to the public. Um, Mr. Chair, I don't know if you want me to pause for questions now or just keep going. Sure, let me ask, are there questions on the first part of the presentation, anyone? Thank you, we'll move on to the second part, but if you do, if you do have questions on this when we come back, we'll, we'll certainly go into them, thank you. Go ahead, Jacob. Thank you, sir. So part two of this is something we're calling community-based transportation plans. So the idea behind this new program, this is also a pilot program. You know, we do a lot of public engagement at Dr. Cog. We do a lot of planning at Dr. Cog. We do that as an agency ourselves. We do that in tandem with you and with our other stakeholders. Um, and so we do a lot of kind of outreach. We do a lot of specific stakeholder and public engagement. One of the things that we want to get better at and get more intentional about is engagement focused on underserved communities, engagement focused from an equity perspective. So really sort of building on the vast array of outreach and engagement that we do, but specifically here, sort of thinking about those communities and those populations. So I'm not gonna read all of these to you, but that's really the focus of the community-based transportation plan is with your help, um, you know, through our local government solicitation that I'll talk about, is to identify um, those underserved communities, whether it's a geographic area or kind of a population lens or whatever the case may be, and to actually go into those communities, meet them where they are, understand what their needs are, yes, from a mobility and transportation perspective, but can we work with them, both you know, the communities, the local governments, and nonprofits, um, community-based organizations, NGOs, 
to really do something meaningful in those communities, even if the result of it is something that, you know, we don't directly provide or don't directly fund. You know, hopefully we can, you know, sort of be part of the solution, but we want to be part of the planning process and part of the solution. But we also want to connect these communities to resources in our region to kind of help them do something tangible that would benefit those communities. So elements of this kind of planning program that we think could include obviously community engagement, identification of transportation needs and challenges, barriers and opportunities. Um, as I said, discussion of possible programs or projects to address those needs and recommended strategies, actions or next steps. We want something tangible to come out of this. We don't, you know, we've all heard about just plans that sit on a shelf. We want this to be meaningful um, to those communities. Um, as I said, we want to focus on kind of those vulnerable communities across our region. Um, and we want to have some equitable community engagement and some different types of community engagement that we've done before. We want to stretch our boundaries and stretch our resources in terms of the types of groups and individuals and entities that we work with in this planning effort. So again, some key things for us here, as I said, historically marginalized groups and disproportionately impacted communities um, in our region. Um, as with the corridor planning program, we're also looking for jurisdiction buy-in. We want to partner with jurisdictions. We want to partner with nonprofits. We want to partner with community-based organizations. Um, you know, we want to identify that planning need and that potential for regional collaboration and the transferability um, of this program over time to benefit um, our region at large. So timeline on this one, um, we sent out what we're calling calls for letters of nomination. You all should have received those. We sent those out in early November because this is naturally a little bit more complex of a program, a little bit more of a lead time on this, so mid-December to have those nominations due. Um, and then as we get into early next year, we'll be working to kind of sift through those, um, select again. We want to do two communities, either closely together or at least pretty close together in terms of time frame, just like the corridor planning, um, so that we can learn uh, from kind of two different community-based transportation plans. Um, again, we'll hire either a consultant or contract with a community-based organization to help us move forward with this, and we expect to kick off the planning work for this in early 2023. And so with that, that's all I have. We just, um, this is informational. We just wanted to keep you apprised, let you know about these two new programs and where we think we're going. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Jacob. Uh, Director Levy. There we go. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Jake. I, I had just a question about, uh, well, maybe two pieces. Um, language access in your outreach to um, underserved, marginalized communities, is there a plan to have some assistance with language access? And, and then I wasn't clear whether who would be the convener of these community-based organizations is Dr. Cog going to do that directly? Um, it, I'm aware of some organizations that really specialize in that kind of engagement that would have multicultural competency and, and outreach experience. Yeah, thank you, Director. Those are both great questions. Let me start with the language one. I think the answer to both of those is, is probably yes, and, and the answer to both of those is we want to see what we get in the door. We challenged you all as local governments um, and this is an important point I should make as well in terms of defining, you know, what are these communities? And we give a, we give a lot of thought. We're doing an agency-wide equity project at Dr. Cog. We're thinking about this very carefully and intentionally. What we decided at the end of the day for this solicitation, letters of nomination, is we want you all, and this is written in the solicitation. We have a web page with more information. We want you all to define for us, you know your communities best, what are those areas? Is it a geographic area? Is it a population? Whatever it is. But to get to your point, Director, once we see what those submissions are and what those particular communities are and the characteristics of those communities, that will help us better respond, both on the language side, but I think the answer is yes, um, and on the sort of nonprofit side, the NGO side. Our concept there is that the local government will submit the letter of nomination, but we are looking for partnerships with those NGOs, with those community-based organizations. We want to do that as a partnership. We would probably be the convener, but in partnership with the local government. And we may contract with a community-based organization, something we've done a little bit before. But again, we're trying to stretch ourselves here and work with different groups and different entities that we've done before. So I think we're open to all of that. And we want to see where this goes and what we can learn. Thank you. Uh, Director Shahrazi. <laughs> Yes, thank you. I wanted to clarify, are the CBOs in the communities that you've 
chosen or are the CBOs a separate nomination process? No, thank you for that. Not a separate nomination process. They don't have to be physically located in the community, but we are looking for those NGOs or CBOs um, that work in those communities, that understand those communities, that would work in partnership with both us and the sort of you know jurisdiction, the local government or the county uh, where the where the plan would take place. So will there be a second then uh, outreach component specific to that group? Yes, um, although again, I think based on once we receive the submissions, that will help guide us a little bit on kind of the contracting arrangements um, that we would do with an NGO or a CBO. Um, in terms of what do we need to kind of work with this community. Could be a constellation of several of those, or maybe the local government would want to take the lead but recommend one or two CBOs to work with. We're, we're flexible. We just want all of those array of entities as part of this universe of the planning effort. And Sorry, one more follow-up question. Just uh, is there a consideration for incentivizing CBOs' participation? Like, will they be compensated for their time in participating for the we are contemplating that, yes. I do want to be careful in saying that we need to follow our federal regulations about how we can contract with federal funds, but we have been talking to some peer agencies around the country. The Metropolitan Transportation Commission um, in the San Francisco Bay Area has a program like this. Uh, we've talked to some other COGS and MPOs, too, um, who, who have been sort of doing some kind of contractual arrangements with kind of nonprofits or CBOs. So the short answer is yes, we just need to figure out the mechanics of what that looks like. Thank you. Director Sutton? Gone now? Yes. yes. I don't see a red circle. Anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure I understand the entire scope of this whole process. I'm just curious. I'm not a big fan of these uh, express lanes where people pay extra money on highways. I don't think they promote equity. So would those kinds of plans be uh, deprioritized, or is there any sort of stance on rest lanes that you pay for with respect to equity promotion? I'm just curious. Yeah, I appreciate the question. Um, pretty specific kind of micro issue, understand where you're coming from. I think it's a little bit of a separate arena in terms of our overall transportation planning effort. But again, we want to meet these communities where they are. We want to hear what's important to them. So if we get comments like that, we, we certainly want to hear that and understand that in terms of the implication for those communities. But as a global issue, we deal with that more generally as part of our regional transportation planning process. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Any questions or comments on the first half of the presentation? I don't see any. Thank you. Thank you, Jacob. Thank you. Next up is our 2021 annual report on traffic congestion in the Denver region, Robert Spots. Anybody have any trouble getting down here today? <laughs> You're going to hear why. <laughs> Thank you. All right, good evening and thank you uh, for spending some time with me this evening. Um, <laughs> Y'all remember 2021? That was a different time. <laughs> Feels like a really long time ago. No, normally these reports come a little late in the year, the following year. And then, you know, it's kind of this update, but 2021 seems like, for, how many shots have you all had since 2021? Um, <laughs> so. <laughs> Almost finished up. Yeah. I hear you. I had four coming. Yeah, that's that's. It's been a long road, but here we are talking about 2021. Um, we spent a little time talking about what happened in 2021, the traffic volumes, just changes to the travel that we, we've seen in our uh, regional roadways. Oh, yeah. We're still going to look ahead to 2050. What some of the things we've been doing around Dr. Cog and what the pandemic may mean for the future with us and just some general um, congestion mitigation approaches here. So let's start off with uh, the slide of the year. So, you know, we start this, we've been doing this since about 2000, right? And uh, before 2000 and through about 2006, VMT was kind of on this, vehicle miles traveled were on this straight line up. The population was growing, the vehicles were growing. And around 2006, actually before the recession really kicked in, something weird happened and VMT started leveling out a little bit. Then that recession hit, and that really, really um, leveled things up for five years or so. Started climbing out of there, 
Um, and it seemed like we were really accelerating. But then those last two years, 2018, 2019, it kind of leveled out again. We're, we don't know whether we're on this course of kind of leveling out, that maybe corrected after the recession. And then something happened in 2020 that greatly affected the VNC, um, uh, the pandemic. <laughs> um, so where are we now? We think pretty big bounce back, but still on average, roughly, VMT in 2021 was about 3% less than in 2019. That's with about 60, 70,000 people, more people in the region than before. So the region continued to grow through that pandemic, still much less VMT, which leads to the VMT per capita also looking a little funky. So as you can see through the recession also, we were growing. So even though VMT was flatlined, VMT per capita going down pretty significantly grew. And then and you can see it's still like, we're still significantly lower well, the pandemic hit, and then with the bounce back is not to that 3% less. The, the region kept on growing, but VMT per capita is even significantly lower than that. Um, the MetroVision target is about 23, so we got there during the pandemic. We've bounced back a little higher than that MetroVision target afterwards. But I don't know where this graph's going to go next year. It's going to be really interesting to see. You know, there, there are so many unknowns in the short term and I think leading into the long term of what, what these changes in our, in our trip-making behavior and travel – Teleworking, all these things have meant for um, travel in the region. So stay tuned. 2022 will be a great year to see. Um, just to take you down a stroll through 2021, since this graph kind of tells it, this is just one of the kind of more average, I would say, um, annual traffic, automated traffic recorders. So they, they record traffic volumes 24-7. The blue line compares what happened in 2021 compared to 2019. So in January, if you recall, that's before most people had vaccines available to them. That's when mask uh, requirements were still pretty high in, in force, or at least highly suggested. Um, starting towards May and June, that's when wide access to vaccines um, became available to people. And you know, trip making in vehicles kind of followed that trend got pretty near um, to 2019 levels. In fact, by October and November, at this station at least, BMT had gotten higher uh, in 2021 than 2019. And then in December, along comes Omicron. And, um, you know, we, we dip back down. Not only Omicron, we had some snow and things like that. So this, this chart shows one location, and, and it's relatively to 2019 that kind of recovery to normalcy and then the dip below. But we're going to look at some other areas too, because this, this, the way we've been looking at data during this process has really opened up our eyes to how different facilities are used. You know, a facility um, in a more um, commercial area like the top two, I-270 York and, and Grand and 104th or a lot of commercial activity, you know, they never, dipped down as far as kind of the average throughout the region. There was still so much activity happening there, lots of commercial activity. They were still reaching their full capacity on those roadways at times, um, and they were just less affected by the pandemic. Whereas a corridor like US 36, which happens to carry a lot of telework replaceable types of trips, commuter trips where people are going from Louisville and between Boulder and downtown Denver and things like that. That's where we saw these huge decreases. And you can see it never got back to full, full 2019 levels and it's still, in, in December of 2021, it's still 15% lower than the volume of 2019. So, you know, these different types of roadway facilities are certainly carrying different types of traffic and different types of behavior. When we look at how that behavior changed over the course of the day, so we're looking at another example station where this is uh, going from midnight to midnight. You know, you see the uh, April of 20, this is in April. So orange is 2019 blue 2020, green April 2021. So April 2019, that's what we would expect. These two, these AM peak, you know, a little bit low, low in the midday, and then you got your PM. Um, in April 2020, obviously that thing got really super flat and low. There, were, there weren't these big AM, PM peaks. People were still kind of moving around, but there wasn't the, the peaking before. By April 2021, the PM peak had basically gotten back to 2019 levels. Same with the midday, lots of activity, but those lazy people in the morning just would not get up out and out of bed. <laughs> they were just loving the pandemic, <laughs> sleeping in. <laughs> so uh, we're going to take a look at October now. And, it, you know, that, that same kind of trend, even in 2020, we were 
all all ships rising to kind of 2019 levels. But we've still seen, even looking at some data through this year, that AM peak is just not. And I don't know if you've anecdotally experienced that yourself. Maybe the PM peak is just about as bad as before the pandemic, but the AM peak just is a little lighter, generally speaking, throughout the region. So, you know, I think there's a lot we don't know. There's there's obviously changes to telework. There's people are getting delivered goods now instead of going to grocery stores. Um, there's been some really fundamental changes in the way we think about travel, when we travel, the places we're going. There's a yeah, we just we're just going to have to follow this thing and see it. You know, especially as we evolve. You know, the, the dip of Omicron that continued through 2020, the early parts of 2022. We're still in a new normal, if you want to call this normal at all. We're going to look at some other modes of transportation. Uh, this is looking at two years. That blue is traffic volumes, and we've been looking at that, but this is two years now. You can see the initial pandemic dip in, in, in April of 2020. But, you know, like we discussed, traffic volumes kind of got closest back to the baseline there by the end of 2021, a little bit lower on average, 3% is what we said. As we know, transit ridership has not had that success of, of bouncing back. Um, we also know that uh, RTD is doing everything they can and all transit providers to reimagine themselves, to um, reevaluate these new new trends, new landscape, and how to recover that ridership and get those people back on, on, on transit. This is always just such an interesting station because uh, on, on the orange line is the traffic volumes, the blue bars, that's um, airport uh, passengers going through DIA. Obviously, the traffic on Pena is super correlated with those number of passengers, although there's a ton of development out there, people using that facility to get home and whatnot. But um, I don't know much, much to say here, except that you know n traffic on Pena has not recovered to its full extent, and the passengers hadn't either by the end of 2021. All right, one more. So uh, this is micromobility trips. So that is shared scooters, bikes, dockless, docked. Um, 2019, we, this was a pretty hot topic, if you recall, around this table and many others uh, in the region. Uh, and it was kind of this emerging new thing, <coughs> relatively low number of trips, um, but you can see the, even the seasonality of it. There's so much to look at in this fun chart, but there's a seasonality. People like to use them a lot more when it's warm, obviously, than in the winter. We're going to go to 2020 now. So we're adding 2020, and it's interesting that in April, you know, the heart of the pandemic, much less than 2019, but the next month, already people, and this is more to do with the expansion of, of these devices out there, but it's kind of, it's, to me, it's, it was surprising to see this and think, wow, in May of 2020, when we are afraid to touch anything, hand sanitizer, everything, yeah. that people were using these shared devices at a, at a level higher than um, in May of 2019. And that continued throughout uh, most of the pandemic, except except the winter there. And now we're going to add 2021, and you can see that you know again this is just really the, the increase in the availability and and people integrating these types of devices into the routines um, using these. And I got to give credit this this data is made available through um, a partnership we've made with you all, local jurisdictions, and and the providers. In fact, we won an award for this. Uh, at, from the Association of Metropolitan Planning Organizations recently because it's really cool data. We're looking forward to using this in a lot of ways and keeping tabs on, on this mode. All right, so what does this mean for 2050? We don't really know. Uh, we, we do project that there's going to be a lot more people here. We, we're still sticking with this. There's going to be about a million more people here by 2050. And generally speaking, there's not going to be that many new roadway facilities. There's going to be not that much more capacity. I mean, <laughs> uh, you know, one of the, the metrics we've been saying lately is congestion at 2 p.m. in the afternoon is going to be about as bad as 5 p.m. now. So we think there's going to be a lot more congestion here. That's, that's at least one version of the future. And we can kind of do this and we look at this corridor by corridor, facility by facility. Uh, the red lines are what's congested in 2021. The orange lines are what's congested by 2050. So Quite a bit congested today, a lot more congested by 2050. Um, so, you know, what are we going to do with this? And I, we've kind of just selected three little projects to kind of discuss how this helps um, us mitigate congestion. I don't know if you guys have seen this project, but it's, it's kind of near me, so I'm maybe biased, but it's such a cool project because that orange line, this is a new bike facility here, uh, Hamden, Colorado, and that orange line, this is the Highline Canal, 
You actually used to be on the bike path and have to wait at the crosswalk and cross Colorado and the wait at the or wait and cross Hamden. Now there's two underpasses there along this beautiful new new corridor there. Um, it's just a really neat facility, and I encourage you all to try to take a ride through there. So why is this important? You know, it's 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 you can look at it. Sorry. No, I kind of like the painted rocks. No. <laughs> Fair. All right. Our art is in the eye of the beholder, I guess. <laughs> is that it? So as a native, painting rocks, isn't that like defacing the rocks? I mean, we were always raised that you're not supposed to write on the rocks, you're not supposed to scratch on the rocks. And then they go and paint rocks. I don't get it. Oh, I don't God. think they're right. They're not rocks? Now you're telling me they're not rocks? Shut up. I hope the rocks aren't destroying people from using the facility. <laughs> you know, aside from, obviously we're trying to incentivize people to safely travel in other ways outside of single occupancy vehicles. Um, but not only um, does that provide this option for a safer way, when that person is using this facility to avoid driving, they're, they're avoiding congestion themselves, right? They're, they're not uh, interfacing with that road that may be heavily congested, and they're, they're, they're going a faster way that works for them. They're also notching down the number of vehicles on the roadway, which greatly helps congestion. Even taking a little bit off the roadway really reduces that level of congestion. I'm going to say this basically the same about these two. Busting has been such a successful program, especially these long VMT um, trips, you know, where somebody would normally would have driven for a really long way. And, you know, at the end of the day, those whatever 50 people on that bus, it don't, they may only be de decreasing volumes on that roadway by 50 people, but gosh, they're avoiding congestion. They're not sitting there pulling out their hair, driving. They're, they're you know, surfing on their phone, getting work done, uh, whatever they want. And then this other very cool project on the right, oops, that table is unassociated, sorry. Uh, the, it's a, just a new, um, a new uh, it's called TransSuite Traffic Control System. We've been, Dr. Cog's been involved with this, but really good coordination of signal timing along long corridors so that, that we can react quicker to crashes, lead to increased safety, um, signal timing and preparing for alternate routes whenever an incident may happen. So just these types of programs just really add up, and I'll speak more to that later. We, there's another table in, in your report I should have mentioned. You all have this report. You can read it to your children. Uh, take it home. Uh, <laughs> It's really cool. It's fun to hand out something for the first time in two years. Uh, another table, just, just a, some examples of all the great work you all are doing. Look forward for more of this and the tip calls coming up here. So, um, to kind of summarize some of this, you know, there's, we're a growing region. We just expect some congestion to increase. It's just, you know, there's, there's very little we can do with a million more people coming here in a really established roadway network. Um, but we can work together to kind of mitigate these major increases. Um, and then the work we've done in greenhouse gas, I'd be remiss to say it's been, you know, it's such a learning process for us, both technically and the availability of data and these strategies to um, com combat um, a, a, challenging, a challenging issue. And the greenhouse gas planning standard really helped us, you know, make even more clear that there's no silver bullet. It's going to take just an extensive portfolio of things here. You know, every single bike head project or every single coordination thing we all do together, you know, chips away at this. And those little chipping away has a really big impact in just lowering congestion that much. And when congestion is lower, greenhouse gas emissions are lower too, significantly. So, um, you know, it's been a big and busy year learning about this stuff. And, and thank you for all the work you've done and the amazing projects and the progress we're making here um, as, we, as we continue to grow. And then, you know, throwing up some of these other cool things that are going on in the region. And with that, I will take any other questions. Hopefully not about art. It's not my... <laughs> Thank you, Robert. Uh, questions? Director Mulvey. Hey, I have one. It's kind of a question and kind of a comment, too, but it dovetails with the question that was asked earlier. In this process, I'm gratified to know that you consider how things are different in different communities. So, for example, in the, in the vicinity of Arapahoe County and Cherry Hills Village, a ped bike underpass, we're trying to do a ped bike overpass, and that not, every, not everybody's needs 
are the same, but every little bit matters. And so if that's what I'm getting from it, I really appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you. Is that one of the things we should take away from it, Robert? I would hope so, yes. Thank you. Uh, uh, Director Spear. I just had a question about um, the RTD chart that was showing transit use before and after COVID. Um, is there one that controls for availability of services as well? Because services have gone down coming out of COVID. And so I'm just curious, are people really riding services less or is it just that there are fewer services now? That's a good question. And I might look to Brian for some help, but I, generally speaking, you know, it was a simple metric. You're right, it's ridership. So there's a lot missing in that simple metric. It, it tells you something, but not the whole story for sure. Director, oh, I'm sorry, Director Levy. Come on. Oh, there we go. Sorry about that. Thank, thanks for the presentation. You know, there was there was something in here that was very interesting and uh, unexpected for me, which was the note that over half of daily VMT is not associated with commuting. And you know, we there is so much emphasis put on commuters, and even transit timing is peak hour service, if at all to Director Spears point. Uh, and I'm, I'm just wondering about the, you know, what, what effort is going into reducing VMT for these non-work related trips? That is a very good question. And you're right. Um, you know, when you think about VMT, there's so much going on with, in the Denver region, um, there's commercial travel. How, how, how can we make that more efficient with curbside management or um, combining routes or you know, smaller distribution um, centers? Uh, there's airport trips. Can we get those people coming in from Wyoming or uh, from the, the east outside of our region? How, how can we deal with those trips? So there's a lot, there's a lot of big, long trips that are coming into this region because we are like kind of we are a big center of the whole state. So those are a huge chunk of chips. Aside from commuting trips, I mean you're right that we hope that when you build that bike path, that it's not just for commuters, right? Or not just for recreational people. You hope that the people that are going to grab some groceries could maybe do that on an e-bike and now they feel safe doing that. So we hope that most of these strategies work for not just commuters but all people as, as they're traveling to their destinations. And I, I had another question um, about the data about micro mobility and people using scooters and and um, you know the the bike shares and those things. Do we know whether that use is mode shift or something else? Yeah, I'm a little outside my lane here, but you know it's it's a it's a really big question. Do we have yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I, I mean, I can defer to Ron. I don't know what he knows about this, but I do recall in a presentation that I've seen about this that it is is replacing primarily walking trips. Maybe I should look to Nicholas for this because I know he's well in depth. Dr. Williams. So a survey survey we conducted back kind of earlier in the the, the scooter era, about 30% of trips replaced. Uh, single occupancy vehicle trips going going down to you know different yeah definitely some of them are replacing walking trips um, uh, sometimes transit and I think you see some of that but you know I think one of the interesting things as you see the the, the ridership increased I mean it blinked for a second in April and then back above and if you look at the geographic distribution of that as well it's much more dispersed so you're getting folks um, uh, using it that hadn't used it in areas. And areas where maybe transit uh, activity had receded, you know, this becomes a real nimble uh, replacement on that. But we saw about 30% non-scientific study, but that's consistent with a lot of the other municipalities that have these types of programs. Thank you. Is that it? Yeah. Uh, Director Nermella? I had a question about the signal timing and just what kind of benefit does that provide in terms of reduction in um, greenhouse gas emissions and other than making me happy when I'm driving on the road. Um, and, then, and I'm also just curious to know um, just how much of our arterials are actually timed. I feel like 
not enough that I drive on. Um, but that would be, I'm just curious if we map those or. Uh. So, uh, do you want to go? I'll just start by saying that, you know, if it takes you three cycles of the light to get through that intersection, you're, you're basically getting zero miles per hour for that four or five minutes, right? You're sitting there idling, getting zero miles per hour. If you can make the flow through that corridor, you know, even if it's 20, 25 miles on average, you know, without so many stops and starts, that's much lower um, emissions. And we, we actually, every time we do time a, a corridor, we calculate those emissions. So really big emissions, and especially if you, um, at, a, at a bigger scale, when you combine the efforts throughout the region, which we do at Dr. Cog, we have a signal timing program. We work with local jurisdictions throughout the region on corridors every year. And then most jurisdictions have some, some control of their, their, their own signals and work with us or, or the partner agencies to, to time them. But it looks like Doug has more to add. Mr. Rex, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. No, thank you very much for the question. And um, yeah, re related to the greenhouse gas, really well, we got to remember, right, every time when you turn on the ignition of that vehicle, it's generating greenhouse gases, right? So, um, so theoretically, you know, the quicker you can get folks through a corridor, the better to get from point A to point B. And I think that's <laughs> primarily the reason, you know, why, you know, we what we believe it is a successful mitigation strategy, right, is to, is to continue our regional traffic operations program. Um, I will tell you that uh, as far as the, the depth of our program and the, the, the comprehensiveness, most all, well, all principal arterials and most minor arterials, so most section, what we used to call section line roads and that, that are multi-jurisdictional are the ones that we really concentrate. Um, and that's through throughout our entire region. And I'll tell you, this is, I've, I've said this before, it's the hidden jewel of the work that we do in transportation planning here is not something we talk an awful lot about. Engineers, you know how modest they are. They don't like to talk about it. But we work so closely with your staffs and making sure that we have the best timing we have. And we do, as Robert mentioned, we do profiles on each corridor after we retime those. And the significant savings that we see, we see savings in travel time, increase in speeds. Um, and also, we also have in that part of that profile, the, the greenhouse gas emissions that, that is seen from, from that improvement. Greenhouse gas, I said emission savings. If I didn't, that's what I meant. Thank you. Uh, if I could say, that's a variable that we don't seem to be uh, measuring uh, very efficiently or effectively right now. But as an example, when I drive in from Southwest Denver for RTC for an 8.30 meeting in the morning, uh, it took me 45 minutes a month ago to do that. Uh, whereas if I come in for my city council committee at 1030 in the morning and there's less traffic, it takes me 25 minutes. So for the 45 minutes my engine was running, I'm emitting more GHG, almost 50% more. Well, actually, almost 100% more. I'm sorry. Shouldn't do math on the fly in my head. But, that, but that's, that's, a, uh, that's a factor that's not often talked about in terms It's not just vehicle miles. It was the same vehicle miles traveled, but almost twice as much GHG because of the congestion. Director Shaw. I would also add that um, not so often uh, moving cars hit each other. It's generally when you're stopping for a light that somebody's not paying attention. So yeah, exactly. Much, much safer, I think, to keep traffic moving. Thank you. Thank you, Director Rex. Thank you so very much. And I'll be quick because I, I wanted to get back to a question that uh, Director Levy mentioned with regards to, you know, our different travel patterns that are occurring now, right? That you are tr correct. I mean, our commute trips as a percent of whole have continuously gone down throughout the years. In my early days, it was, I mean, it was clearly the largest split, right, of traffic, but it's not necessarily the case anymore. And I think that's part of the conversation that we want to have next week, right, with our, our either board work session related to the housing um, a conversation is that we want to tie that back to our Dr. Cog missions and we believe that there is, you know, we want to have that conversation with you all about what that looks like, transportation related housing and, you know, trying to accommodate a new world in which, um, you know, those trips are occurring during the day, right, and making mixed use development a priority and those types of things. So we'll talk about all about that in a couple of weeks. Thank you. Director Odoricio. Uh, I think it's important that we are always constantly trying to find different ways to reduce greenhouse gases and congestion and all those things. I think it's good. Um, I kind of always just come back to the, the basics of 
um, uh, why don't we work with the schools on the car lines and design there? And why aren't we, you know, can we do things to, to help improve things like efficiencies and pickups and drop-offs and other sorts of areas? I mean, we're not going to tell people to not go pick up their kids. We're not going to tell people that you got to stop driving to the store or to other places. So, I mean, at the end of the day, we got to keep working on it. But bottom line is most of the people that are out there driving are normal people. Pick up their kids, you know, stop at the store. They're doing just life. And so um, I think it sounds good. I just want to make sure we're always not just in a vacuum thinking about these high-level things. That at the end of the day, people are living – what lives are living like in America, and we got to figure out how to accommodate them and how to help them be able to accomplish these goals because we're not going to be able to shame people into not picking up and dropping off their kids and going to the store. Mr. Rex, go ahead. No, Director Aricio, thank, Odoricio, thank you so much for the comment. I, I, I have a tendency to agree with that 100%. I think we have to be very pragmatic in our approaches to this type of thing, whether we're looking at you know policy endeavors as we talk about housing or not. I mean, we you know, I, I I really appreciated your comment with regards to um, pickup lines, school school pool lines, and the like. We actually have a program at Dr. Cog called School Pool, which is nationally recognized for the success that it's had. Now we deal primarily with uh, with private schools and and the like, but I mean, it, it is a great opportunity for us to have larger conversations and look at pragmatic approaches to how we can we can be who we want to be when we grow up, right? So I I I appreciate the comment. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, Director Sutton. Okay, now, it's on now. I, I, a number I found staggering in this report was that the total cost of these delays is one and a half billion dollars. And I think that's a number we should use when we put up transportation bonds. And that's, it's using $12 an hour. That seems really cheap. Now that's less than a minimum wage. I think we should bump up that $12 an hour and say, Colorado, front rangers are spending $3 billion in wasted time sitting in their cars. Can you cough up some money for a transportation bond so we spend less time sitting in our cars? I mean, that's a big number. So I would recommend that you justify higher than $12 per hour and start selling that number as a real cost. Thank you. Uh, I want to follow up on Director Odoricio's comments about real life and real people living their lives. And Robert, I don't know if you can derive from the data that we saw. Uh, I have just heard in casual conversation with people who know about these or claim to know about these things that uh, with the drop in commuting driving during the pandemic and and then recovering from the pandemic, that I was surprised that only that we're only uh, three percent was a three percent uh, we're back up to three percent. So with all the people I know are working from home, city staff, city of Denver staff, I don't know about all your other staffs, uh, but the number of people working from home, I'm shocked that we've climbed back to within three percent of 2019. So, I have heard anecdotally from people who study these things that there are a lot of new trips, picking up the kids from school where you didn't do that before because you were working and they went after school to daycare and you picked them up on that same trip. So are vehicle miles travel going up because there's new driving that's being done by people who are now working from home? I know of staff that's worked from home. I work from home a lot. I'll run over to King Supers, grab something, I'll go to the bank as long as it's open. So I'm doing more trips. Are we hearing anything in the data? Are we seeing anything in the data that says that that's true or false? Or you don't know? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm a real person and I, I've done all those things that you just talked about. So, <laughs> yeah, I, I, you know, I think there's a lot we don't know still. You know, we're, we are we're really excited. We're going to have our household survey, statewide household survey coming up here beginning pilots starting the, towards the end of this year and moving into next year. So you're going to learn a lot about the new type of people's behavior coming up. Yeah, I literally did those things today. I went to pick up my, I worked from home, picked up my kids, drove to the board meeting instead of taking the train. The good thing about that, I might add, is that it puts those trips outside of the peak hours. So it tries to, it, it 
tends to level the peak. Uh, can I go to Director Mulvey? Go ahead. Yeah, I'm dovetailing on all of that. Um, we have a we put a traffic counter right at the border of town where unincorporated people have to travel to go to a school that's in another unincorporated area, but it goes right through my uh -huh. municipality. There is no way for kids to bike or or any other transit in that area, and the traffic counter shows that it's school traffic. Really? And that's aside from the carpool line you have to drive to when you get up there. But it is it is remarkably increased, and it is school traffic. So, you know, we're trying to study those things, and, and we appreciate that all of that's being considered. There's nothing you can do about it when it's not your municipality. Thank you. There have been days during the pandemic I felt like an unincorporated person myself. Uh, <laughs> Director Odoricio. And I just think it, it would be interesting to, when you do that survey, tracking how often people are ordering stuff to and from their home, uh -huh. how often that shipping, because that's got to be a lot. I mean, people are so good when we sit at home and say that I didn't drive today, but then we had four packages. <laughs> <laughs> My know, wife. Three meals delivered and ended the day with Drizzly bringing a bottle of booze. So I think that's it. Just be interesting to see how our true life patterns have impacted all of this. And and that's a diesel. Yeah. Right. Thank you. My wife has sent Jeff Bezos twice into space with her <laughs> with her purchases. Uh, did I see another hand up, uh, uh, Director Coombs? Oh, okay. Sorry. Um, so my only kind of addition to that, because I agree, right, I also have run out to the store, then picked up the baby, then driven somewhere that I might in the past not have driven, um, is that I hope we can create opportunities for folks um, to make other choices. As we're having these conversations about housing and planning and design, you know, how do we give people the opportunity and the option to do otherwise? Because as I've mentioned yes. before, when we live in neighborhoods that are totally sprawling and our main route to get anywhere is a 10 lane road, it is a little hard to have other options and other opportunities. So we can still look at what we can do so that people can do everyday person life activities and not have to take it's built uh, a lot of uh, worker satisfaction, I think. I think the baby's been trying to speak all all meeting yeah. to it. Is anything to say, <laughs> uh, Director Normella? So, oh, as a planner, um, I'm also dealing with uh, just developments as they are occurring. And one of the things that we run into are school districts um, and the traffic that each school generates, and they're not really required to be responsive to the cities with respect to um, traffic patterns, appropriate uh, queuing lanes, both on and off sites. We're working um, for my day job. I work for Erie, and we're working very proactively with uh, both uh, Boulder Valley School District and St. Drain, but that's something that we as a is a relationship that we've had to develop over the years in Westminster we have not had as much luck working with Adams County or Jefferson County with respect to just listening to cities having our transportation um, engineers being able to weigh in so that's a that's a challenge and then on the other side I would love to see more funding available for underpasses to schools because as a parent I would not allow my kids to go and cross big arterials um, and so underpasses are key to getting people comfortable with getting, allowing their kids to bike. So. Thank you. Uh, Director Ricks. All right. This will be my last comment. I'm energized by, by uh, this conversation and great and seeing everybody in person about the safety. I wanted to hit on that real quick. And I, I agree with the comments they made about, um, you know, listen, we know we need to continue to, to diversify our transportation portfolio, right? I mean, everybody in this room, I believe, understands that. But what we do know is that unless we have safe options available, they ain't using it, right? And uh, so that, I mean, I think that's why we're seeing, you know, somewhat of a different tact in how we approach that. But we, again, but we still need to be pragmatic in those investments to make sure that what we're providing is something people are going to use, right? And, I, and to your point, I think underpasses, those types of things that give 
parents and others more confidence to be able to try something else um, is where we really should be directed. And I think as a board, you guys are doing that. So thank you all so very much. Thank you. And Director Daigle. Oh, yeah? oh, okay. So um, as far as school districts are concerned, I appreciate the fact that, you know, municipalities have to reach out to school districts because there's not many people that do both. Um, I happen to be one of those and have for many, many years, and it can be very challenging. Um, but uh, one of the things, and there are many, many studies on this, but to convince people to drop their kids off at 10 and start school at 10, we would not only have less emissions, less traffic, we would have smarter children. Because if you look, if you look at these studies, it actually shows that especially when they get up in junior high and high school, they don't even start thinking until 10. So I always, all of my children, if they had math and science, they had it first in the morning, and any of their other garbage classes was late in the afternoon and after lunch. But anything early in the morning, it better be PE because your kids are not going to do well unless you do so. So that is just something that I've learned since, you know, I've been on a school board forever. Um, but you can't get people to, to buy into that. They're, they want to be able to drop their kid off at school and then head to work. If they're, if, you know, if we're changing patterns of work and whatever, why don't we start thinking about changing school patterns for kids? Because it would benefit everyone, including the kids, because they actually do do much better earlier in the morning and then they're garbage after lunch. So just keep that in mind when you're helping your kids do your schedule. Thank you. But it is a really, it's a real thing. I've been looking at it for a long time. And that would, be, that would be key if you could talk with your school district and say, hey, let's do some different pa patterns. Let's start school a little later so that you can do that. Thank you. Good luck with that, though. Comments, questions? <laughs> Thank you for the great discussion. Uh, we had a lot more discussion on this, Robert, uh, than we did on our action item, which involved spending millions of dollars. <laughs> <laughs> But I think it shows that uh, we, we want to be forward looking and uh, and put more some, more intentionality into our choices. So thank you for the great discussion. Uh, we have three informational items uh, for your for your information. Uh, draft transportation planning framework document, administrative modifications to the 22-25 tip, and the draft 23 policy statement on state legislative issues, uh, Mr. Lindstedt. <laughs> Uh, move on to uh, committee reports. Uh, report from the STAC, Nick Williams, Director Williams. Thank you, Mr. Chair. STAC met in November with one action item regarding the Federal Lands Access Program, we'll call it FLAP. Uh, this also included a action item to select a representative for the FLAP's Local Program Decisions Committee. Uh, FLAP provides federal funding to improve transportation facilities, provide access to, adjacent to, or located within federal lands. Uh, projects are selected through a state programmatic decisions committee, include state, federal, local representatives. Next call is anticipated uh, in 2024 for approximately 16 million statewide. And at the meeting, the stack selected Commissioner Keith Baker, representing the San Luis TPR, as the primary member and Commissioner Kristen Stevens from the North Front Range TPR as alternate to represent STAC on this local program decisions committee. Also two information items. First was a transit in Colorado 2022 update from the Colorado Association of Transit Agencies or CASTA. We received uh, just an overview of the kind of non-RTD transit service performance for 2022, and also a report of the ozone season transit grant program uh, that CASTA administered for free fare for agencies other than RTD. 14 agencies participated uh, and saw ridership increases ranging between 2% and nearly 60%. And then finally received a budget update from CDOT's chief financial officer uh, for the 2023-2024 annual budget allocation plan. Uh, this draft budget will be presented to the Transportation Commission in February uh, and uh, uh, approved in March of 2023. 
and the allocation plan can be found on CDOT's website. That's it for me. Thank you. Uh, clearly, our sector is running out of acronyms, right? <laughs> Okay. If, if you had breakfast there, you could have had a stack of flapjacks. You realize that? Uh, Metro Mayor's Caucus, uh, Director Starker. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. The uh, caucus met on October 5th. Um, we had a uh, presentation from Paula Deegan with the American Red Cross on uh, active threat preparedness training opportunities for our communities and public safety officials. We had a, a discussion and an informational uh, presentation with, on the Denver Social Impact Bonds with Britta Fisher and Margaret Danauer to talk about that program. And we had a discussion about public safety in the retail setting with the Colorado Retail Council and uh, representatives with Walgreens and Albertsons joined us for that and how we might work with our retail partners to uh, promote public safety. And with that, I'll conclude my report. Thank you. Uh, Metro Area County Commissioners, Commissioner uh, Director Baker. Mac met on October 21st, um, and the main reason, again, our priority is home, to discuss homelessness. We um, had a great discussion about data sharing and how we can improve in that. We heard from multiple commissioners and staff who attended a trip to Houston to study and learn about their homelessness response model, which focuses on housing first. So that uh, um, was the main topics. We did, uh, Commissioner Tracy Kraft Tharp from uh, Jefferson County mentioned she was going to San Antonio, so she solicited infer or questions from all of us to take with her to try to answer when she went to San Antonio. I don't know why these homelessness programs in Texas work so well, but apparently they are. Um, we have can <clears throat> canceled the November 18th MAC meeting because we're going to have a December 1 joint MAC Metro Mayor's Caucus meeting. And uh, that concludes my report. Thank you, Director Baker. Um, up next, Advisory Committee on Aging, uh, Ms. Sanchez Warren. Hi, everyone. Ooh. Thank you so much. Uh, the, the ACA committee received an informational briefing on the regional summit for county councils on aging. Um, on September 30th, we brought together the region's cities commissions on aging, the county councils on aging, the Dr. Cog Regional Advisory Committee on aging, and the Colorado Commission on aging um, together to learn from each other, to understand challenges, and to identify areas where we can come together for the benefit of older adults in our region. It's a very successful um, conference. The committee also received an update, a, a pretty comprehensive update, uh, on the AAA Transportation Choice Services Program. This is our voucher program. So in addition to funding 13 different contracted service providers to provide transportation. We also have this choice voucher program. Um, we've made some changes in our policies and procedures, uh, trying to keep up with the demand. The demand is crazy. It is crazy. Um, provided updates on our transportation and uh, providers, including the rides and trip costs. This voucher program uh, between July 1st, 2021 and June 30th, 2022 provided over 73,000 trips or rides to people. So um, it's a big program for us. It is very busy and we are having a hard time keeping up with the demand. Um, if there's, I was not at this meeting, I was in Washington, D.C. So if when or our director, uh, the, if you want to add anything else or, or, I think you primarily covered it, but um, it it really was a good gathering. I think um, we we all enjoyed it and learned from each other. So that's a lot of it. And and um, your comments about the trip program, it it is frustrating when there are people who really want to take these rides and need them to get to their doctor's appointments and so on. And, and we are unfortunately forced to limit access because of funding. So 
Thank you. Hey, give me a chance at a microphone just to sing the praises of you and your staff. Thank you for all that you do. Thank you. Uh, just to continue to be impressed. Thank you. Thank you, Regional Air Quality Council, uh, Director Rex. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. Three items of note. Um, we reviewed the draft 2023 budget and work program, which we will vote on at the next meeting. We also got an update from Director Mike Silverstein on the State's consideration of the ozone state implementation plan um, is going through their process right now at the Air Quality Control Commission, although I do understand that there was uh, a calculation error in the in a portion of the, um, um, the inventory. Uh, so anyway, so stay tuned. There's more to come on that. And uh, last but not least, we got a presentation from Grace Rink from City County in Denver on uh, Denver's Climate Protection Fund. That is it, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, E-470 Authority, uh, Director Mulvey. Hi, yeah. The, uh, to summarize what happened at the last meeting, the, there were a number of RFPs for financial items relevant to this body. They, uh, some of them will go to traffic and service studies to analyze trends including before, during, and after the pandemic. Um, their toll rate schedule also was the subject of considerable discussion. A lot of that had to do with usage analysis, which has changed um, even this year, and it has to do with the commitment to lower tolls, and this is for E-470, not CTIO, so it doesn't include Northwest, it doesn't include um, 70, and it doesn't include four. Um, C-470. So in any event, the bottom line was that there was a decision not to take immediate action on the toll road toll rates, but to evaluate it in early 2023 because there are market changes that are occurring that impact this as a self-funded road. So the market changes in costs also impact how much tolls are needed, even though there's a strong desire to lower tolls. And then lastly, um, E-470 is going to join the Southwest Hub, which means you can use your pass, like an easy pass, in other locations. And that takes some time, but it's moving along swimmingly, and I think that everybody will benefit from it. Thank you. A report from CDOT, Director White. Hey, good evening, everyone. Uh, well, since we got such a good update from Director Williams on stack, and because we had our first significant snowfall, which was a shock uh, this week, um, I thought I would just give you an update on our efforts at CDOT um, to retain and attract maintainers. Um, I know you've all seen this a lot in the media, but we have sort of a perfect storm, no pun intended right now, with a very tight job market um, and very high housing costs, and that makes it a challenge for us as, as all of you. So I wanted to let you know what we're doing on our end so you can send your drivers to us. Um, <laughs> we have a, uh, updated our housing stipend program and increased um, what we're providing for that. Uh, we're offering a winter performance bonus. We're increasing salaries overall, and we're also starting to build workforce housing, which is pretty awesome. So we've got housing going in Frisco, Fair Play, Basalt, and Gypsum. That won't, those locations probably won't surprise you because it is very hard to uh, find a place to live that is under a very large amount in those communities. So I'm excited to see um, those these changes go in and, and bring on some new folks and retain the ones we have so we can all drive safely. And that's it for me tonight. Thank you. A report from RTD, Director Welch. Good evening, directors. Real quickly, we have finished four of the five initial meetings of our brand new sub-regional service councils. We have the final meeting tomorrow with Boulder County. We are featuring in the, this initial group of meetings the Call for Projects Partnership Program, which will be starting up soon. We now officially, as of yesterday, allow e-bikes on all trains and buses that are able to accommodate them. Yay, Yay. good. Uh, on December 1st, we will be, like other agencies, preparing a report to the state on our zero fare for better air. I've seen a draft. It is all of data and analysis. So you, all of you who like to read the data and analysis, there will be plenty uh, to get into. And then finally, uh, next, early next year, we will be providing uh, an initial look at a recommendation on our fair study and equity analysis, which features a simpler fair structure, uh, improvements to the past programs, 
and a reduction in fares as well. So that's it for RTD tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, under administrative items, ignore what your agenda says. The next meeting is not December 21st. It will be January 18th. Director Levy, we have other matters uh, by members. Director Levy. Uh, yeah, no, just a question. We, we had the legislative priorities in the packet with some revisions and um, I had some comments on it and some questions and I wondered if we're gonna have another opportunity to discuss those. Oh. Yes, Mr. Go Chairman, yeah, Director Levy, yes. Um, so they're in there just for your information now so you, you and your staff can review the whole packet including the changes. Okay. And um, so at our January 18th meeting, we will be having that conversation and looking for your approval of whatever. Thank you. Director Stolzman. Thank you so much. I just wanted to take a moment to um, recognize Director Shaw. Um, it was mentioned earlier in the meeting, but we had just a really lovely um, hosting and presentation by Director Shaw featuring um, mixed-use development along her transit lines. Really impressive um, use of workforce housing, a future with affordable housing, senior housing. It was really special to see what they've done and then what they're continuing to plan. So I just thank Director Shaw for sharing that with everyone. It was really well done. Thank you. Uh, Director Lindstedt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just wanted to take a quick moment. Uh, I've been on this board for three years, and it's been three years of uh, collaboration, professionalism, and friendship. Um, so thank you all for that time. Um, I'm looking forward to working with you all in a different role here next year, um, but I just wanted to, to briefly say thank you for, for these wonderful three years. It's been a tough time to serve in local government, um, and uh, I can't imagine uh, doing this uh, with anyone else. So thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, do any other members have matters? I see none. With that, uh, we are adjourned. Thank you very much. So well, if, we have, yeah. if you're parked in the garage, uh, Melinda has the, uh, the, the passes to get you out of the garage. Yeah.